I have um, the pleasure and privilege to present the next speaker, who is the main organizer of this event, my good friend and colleague, Mao Albarasin. Mao is a PhD student in cognitive computing and has a master's in psychology from the University of UCAM. Their project concerns the way active inference can help us model epistemic communities. And their presentation is entitled, Enacting Gender, an Inactive Ecological Account of Gender and Its Fluidity. So I'll pass things over to Mao. Thanks, Maxwell. And uh, well, welcome back, everybody. I hope the break was welcome. So indeed, that is the title of my presentation. I wish to shout out to Pierre Poirier, who is the second author on this paper, and to Ines Chibolito, who has done a significant amount of work on previous versions of the paper. So today we discuss how we can cast scripts as affordances. Specifically, let's ask ourselves a question. What happens when you want to go to a public bathroom? you have to engage in socially meaningful scripts. Now, each niche has its own set of scripts that we're going to highlight. And if you are alone, you may relax your choice of bathroom. But if you're not alone, your choice will be negotiated. So we propose to understand the cultural, uh, the, the cultural social scripts in the framework of ecological inactivism, which integrates aspects of inactivism, notably the importance of dynamical sensory motor interaction with an environment conceived as a field of affordances. Under this view, scripts based interpersonal negotiation can be linked to the inactive neuroscience concept of a cultural niche, understood as a landscape of cultural affordances. You can read papers such as Ramstead uh, in 2016. As we will see, affordances are possibilities for action whose perception, based both on multisensorial biological, meaning homeostatic bodily skilled capacities, and cultural cues, meaning practices, hermeneutic resources, norms, constrain which actions are pre-reflectively felt possible by an individual. In an industrialized urban setting, for instance, most people feel pre-reflexively uh, that dark rooms can be lit. A switch somewhere affords lighting. Firefighters can be called and should be there uh, for a fire emergency. Phones afford calling 911. And social interactions with strangers can be cut off at will given a few polite niceties. Polite conversation affords control over social interactions. Now, things may go wrong. Uh, to be sure, the switch may be broken, the 9-11 service may be offline, or someone may fail to recognize or ignore the polite niceties of conversation. Following Zahavi and Gallagher in uh, 2008, we understand pre-reflective consciousness as an implicit and first order, as opposed to explicit and higher order, awareness we have before we reflect on our experience. This is how, ecologically, the industrialized urban setting is uh, pre-reflectively felt by most. As they act in a given situation, individuals enact a subset of their landscape of affordances as the situation's field of affordances. You can find work on by Brunberg and Riedveld in 2014, uh, Kirchhoff and Kiverstein in 2019. A situation's field of affordance is the pre-reflexively felt structure of possible actions in that situation. No two agents enact the same field of affordances in any given situation, since fields of affordances depend on multisensorial biological and cultural cues. And no two agents have identical bodies, homeostatically, kinesthetically, and no two cultures, which can be as finely individuated as the individual, offer identical norms and practices. Since humans share biological and cultural commonalities at various spatial and temporal scales, however, 
their collective fields of affordances in a given situation, thus forum is space in which there is structure at multiple temporal and spatial scales. We call this structure, which will be important to understand uh, the, the possibility and constraints on gender fluidity, the fields of affordance space. Any action undertaken by a specific human agent in a given situation will bring forth a new field of affordances, belonging to a new field of foreign space, opening new action possibilities, and so on. Now, gender has its own subset of scripts. Specifically, they are the action of foreign loops constrained by the individual's culturally shaped biological body, the way culturally shaped biological bodies are perceived by others, the cultural norm that shaped these bodies, brains and behaviors, and the political forces that shape these norms. Gendered possibilities reflect the structure in the fields of affordance space. Individuality, but also commonalities at multiple temporal and spatial scales. So the goal of this presentation is going to be to propose that gender is becoming less rigid as a function of the increase in available scripts for all individuals. For an instant, we're going to focus on the inactive framework, as I believe this is a topic of interest. Uh, and in our view, is not incompatible with the FPP whatsoever. The inactive framework proposes that cognitive properties are on a continuum with biological properties, the properties that give rise to and maintain life. This aligns with the feminist embodied conception of cognition, which understands normative life to be felt materially as we interact with the world, but also to be shaped by its materiality. By anchoring cognition to life, inactivism adopts an inherently embodied conception of cognition. On Maturana and Varela's account, life is understood as the self-organization and homeostatic maintenance of chemical reactions. Uh, combination they call, as you all know, autopoiesis. The most basic way for self-organized autocatalytic set of chemical reactions to achieve homeostasis is to build and maintain a semi-permeable membrane to enclose itself in, making it able to weather punctual change in its milieu. By doing so, the autocatalytic set of reactions takes its first step in the journey of variational free energy minimization. It makes viable internal states more probable than less conducive to self-preservation states. For living organism, variational free energy is an information theoretic quantity that is an upper bound on the surprisal of a set of states sampled from its internal or external environment, given a generative model of the causes of the sample. The free energy principle, and I'm supposed to quote Friston, but I mean, I, I believe this goes without saying, states that any cause, uh, that any adaptive living organism resists disorganization by minimizing its free energy. All adaptive living organisms are thus posited to possess a generative model of their environment. A more sophisticated way for an organism to preserve homeostasis and minimize surprise is to be sensitive to changes in conditions inside and outside its membrane and to react appropriately to these changes, notably by sensing and reacting to these changes, creating dynamical action perception loops between organisms and internal or external environment. Active maintenance of homeostasis by action perception loops gives homeostatic value to the environment. Some of its states afford the organism motor actions that preserve homeostasis and some don't. 
it gives a basic kind of meaning to the world. And if you want to read more about this, you can uh, reach into Di Paolo in 2018 or Thompson in 2007. We come to this point. Perceptual and action capabilities are evolved to detect and react to those conditions in the world that are beneficial for maintaining self-organization and to those conditions that are detrimental to it. And the organism will therefore be attracted to the conditions that are beneficial and repulsed by those who are not. In ecological psychology, objects that afford actions to an organism are called affordances. Affordances are possibilities for action that the organism's environment supplies or affords to those that can perform the afforded action. Organisms are able to perform actions to the extent they possess the necessary body configuration, physiology, and skills. And this is an important point. Since body configuration, physiology, and skills change throughout the organism's lifespan, the affordances it finds in a given environment change as well. Affordances are thus time relative. For a given organism, the set of affordances supplied by its environment at a given time is determined by the content of its environment at that time, as well as its configurations, physiology, and skills. The set of affordances an individual um, of, you know, of a type of organism has at a given point is called the individual's umwelt, and I will refer you back to um, Itzel and Melina's conference uh, yesterday. But we can also call this its ecological niche. The space of affordances currently available to an organism is called the organism affordance landscape. And so to an organism able to perceive them, affordances meaningfully structure the environment making it positively value certain aspects and negatively value others. Given an affordance landscape, the free energy minimizing organism will opt for the action, the affordance, which minimizes free energy, which will bring about new affordance landscape, new free energy minimizing action, and a new affordance, and so on. This can apply to any structure which self-organizes. We are thinking cells, humans, but we can also think uh, social groups as you've seen this morning with um, Blue, Daniel, and, um, and Serval's presentation. To stay in the most likely set of states thus, to review, agents have to determine the causal pathways which lead them to the, from the environment. Reacting appropriately to the environment creates action perception loops, and this is what gives meaning to the environment. Meaning is encapsulated in affordances, the fit between an individual and their environment is made clear in their grip on their affordances. The most likely affordance is the one which limits free energy, bringing about a new state of the world and thus a new affordance loop. So now let's consider generative models at higher levels. They encode the probability distribution of affordances. And because of the hierarchical nature of generative models, these probability distribution of affordances are, arrest, are arranged in a nested hierarchy. Restaurants afford many actions, eating, spending money, sitting, meeting people, going to the restroom, that themselves are nested as series of affordances for actions. Some affordances are cultural, embedded in the niche. The existence of a cultural affordance opens the possibility for the presence of sensory motor cultural affordance loops. Let's focus on a script for a moment. In a paper with Maxwell and Axel uh, Constant and Carl Friston, we have defined, we have reviewed the general def definitions of scripts, but also given our own um, definition in terms of weak and strong scripts. A weak script is a cluster of concepts which are generally brought together, but do not necessarily have a strong sequencing. They define the landscape within which the sequencing can happen. A strong script is a form of knowledge structure about the sequence of events or the sequence of the concepts to be produced in a given setting. This knowledge is thought to be encoded in a memory structure that develops as individuals are exposed to multiple varied instances of the setting. But 
Cognitive science traditionally construes scripts as internally memorized sequences of actions, which is representationally and computationally relatively costly and sometimes even brittle. Inactive ecological cognitive science offloads some of those representations and computations to the environment. One does bring a representation of the script, but by becoming sensitive to the fields of affordances an environment presents, and by becoming skillful at producing the actions thereby afforded. On the active inference view adopted here, one becomes sensitive to an affordance in a field when one's generative model predicts the affordance when it is about to become present. Acting upon the action possibilities offered by the environment normally changes the field of affordances, either because its laws, structures, mechanisms make it so, or because other humans who will normally respond in a culturally normed fashion to the field will thus change the field. This new field of affordances may lead to new actions and new fields and so on. As one explores and learns, the fields expand. So why is this important for us? Well, socially, groups afford different action possibilities to individuals who perform actions who conform better to their norms. If you look at the pictures above, um, these people generally represent a socially embedded ideal. Resources are thus afforded to the people who conform to the group norms. When you are a Victoria's Secret model, things tend to go relatively well for you in life. Certain group dynamics afford different things to different statuses of their members, regardless of their conformity to group norms. Certain groups thus predefine a member status which grants more power and thus more affordances over some resources than others. This is where we can start seeing how the, the concept of patriarchy may become relevant to our ideas. Most cultures produce and maintain a gender scripts. However, most being the key word here, some cultures are more complex than this. And it has large scale ramifications on social processes. Power structured have gendered ramifications and institutions are fashioned according to gendered norms and prescriptions. By setting up distinctive affordance landscape for human males and females specifically, by contrasting masculine to feminine, each pole has its own segregated set of conceptual associations. Now there are three major areas which segregate gendered experience. The first is a culturally gendered body that superposes itself on the individual's sexed, male, female, intersex body, or modifying its biological function to some extent. If you want to read more about this, read Fausto Sterling in 2000. The second is a culturally gendered narrative which, once entrenched in an individual's narrative consciousness, forms the basis for the individual's psychological self, an internalized gender that gives psychological meaning to the gendered pronouns his and her. And the third is linked to one of the functions attributed to gender in a gendered society. That is the communication, communication of a social identity through identifiable actions. Now, actions associated with either of these conceptual cluster, either here being an inappropriate term, there could be more than two, will be afforded to agents embodying either of the gendered poles and refuse to others. This is not to say that people are necessarily directly stopped from acting or physically cannot perform an action. It's more subtle than that. Although it used to be more clearly segregated in periods where gender binaries held more sway and can still be this way in certain areas where they do. 
to this day, certain kinds of transgressions are physically punished by other kind of members of society. The interaction of the individual will be constrained by the social environment based on its reading of the individual. Think back to the bathroom. How many incidents of uh, trans women trying to go to the bathroom have we heard on the news? Some constraints will be more about limiting the very appearance of an affordance in a segregated field. Again, if you think of the bathroom, the, the physical landscape of a women in a men's bathroom are very different. And in fact, many women have never seen what the men's bathroom affords or would afford. This is socially signaling that the enactment of the affordance is frowned upon and sometimes other members of society take it upon themselves to make that signal clear. So punishments can vary from overt aggression to ostracization. They have a basis in a culturally determined sense of complementarity. If you want to read more about this, read Jackson, uh, 2006. This is a structure that upholds the heteronormative framework. In that cultural frame, the sense of complementarity between men and women justifies that they need each other and are naturally drawn to each other. Now, the issue here is that cultural scripts are fluid. New scripts can quickly replace old ones and scripts can form new branches. We can identify several sources to this fluidity, um, one being the polysemy of the fields of affordances, which we will discuss a little bit later, and the fact that fields of affordances can be very quickly changed culturally, much faster than reprogramming neurologically encoded sequences of actions. Hence, Changing a script can simply mean making one affordance in a field more salient than before. This can be brought about by learning to focus attention on one aspect of the environment or succeeding more often to it as opposed to another. It can also be brought about by a heavy connection or assimilation between several concepts to go back to the weak script concept. And concepts can break down through accommodation. On the predictive, inactive, ecological accounts, cultural scripts are loosely coupled cognitive structures that can be decoupled from their original script and recoupled into other scripts as the environment demands. This is a feature we can call porosity. This can be done because mastery of sensory motor affordance loop sits at a lower hierarchical level that scripts that learns faster than the higher levels where the full temporal and spatial dimension of the scripts are integrated. As a result, cultural scripts are much more fluid and quickly responsive to environmental change than natural scripts. So here, please keep in mind, I'm discussing traditional um, representations of masculinity and femininity, not in effect an essential masculinity or femininity. It's also clearly embedded in my position as a white person. So there are uh, limitations to the things I'm about to say. But you can take, for instance, the white middle class women and their association to sexuality. In general, it's contradictory. It's seen as in a negative light because of stigmas around sex work. Women whose actions afford sexuality are considered socially unacceptable since they threaten the social order of patrimony and legacy. And you can read uh, Conrad in 2006. Thus, sexual unavailability is considered relatively preferable in traditional femininity. However, women are also objectified. Remember the Victoria's Secrets models. And portrayed as sexual objects of desire for men. Desirable women are preferable to sexually undesirable women because the latter just don't suit the tastes of heterosexual men who generally hold more status in the group. This places women in the ambiguous position of only being able to receive sexual attention but not to offer it, passively affording sexuality but denied actions that afford it. It is effectively a passive position. In contrast, white middle-class men are considered better prototypes of their category if they can engage successfully in sexual conquest. This is an active position. You can look at Buss in 1990. 
This dichotomy entails a sort of natural sequencing where performing masculinity entails acting on, initiating, and pursuing sexuality, whereas performing femininity entails receiving and resisting affordances. The asymmetric and complementary valence of the categories assigned to men and women directly impact the logical sequencing between the category that become deployed into temporarily nested social scripts. These positions based on categories to enact and associations to avoid, as well as their sequencing, create identifiable roles for agents to embody. Now, derogating from a role, as we mentioned before, is risking to be socially unintelligible and thus unpredictable, affording the wrong actions gender-wise. This lack of predictability can be bothersome for other agents for a host of reasons, including the generation of prediction errors, the breakdown of cultural sensory motor loops, and the social threats to hierarchy and functioning. You can look to Crane in 2018. Now, certain individuals or group clearly have more to gain from the social roles being maintained. Uh, look to Pease in 2013 or Harding in 2009. Those whose valence is high will probably benefit more from a given system being upheld and maybe more active in trying to maintain this social order. Again, Cray, Howland, and Russell uh, in 2017, or Flood and Pease in 2005. It is even possible that people who highly benefit from that system may not even perceive the issues it presents for other agents because their perceptual field is made of their own affordances defined by the scripts they embody. Now, more recently, though, there have been more drastic changes as gender has taken on a less binary nature reflected in the myriad new identifications. It is important to note that non-binarity in itself is not new and has existed for a long time outside the boundaries of Western cultures and even in some subcultures in Western cultures. Now, scripts can mean different things to different people or even to the same people in different scenarios. Given similar fields of affordances, two individuals may respond differently and thus enact different scripts or may choose to perform a script differently. Individual, yes, that is Gravity Falls, well done, Marco. Individuals in a situation may wish to express a role they embody, and this role will be partly defined by what affordances other agents offer for the completion of this interaction. As scripts, as scripts require interpretation and an environment, a specific perspective defines how a script will be interpreted, which then leads to the de degrees of variance we observe. Subsequently, the different spaces an agent may be part of requires that they respond appropriately to the group's expectations, which will differ from group to group. Through performance, this identity is made manifest as it is understood by the individual and constrained by the group. There's a sense of agency in the negotiation of what one might wish to express to the external world. For instance, wishing to be seen as one identity marker over another may mean emphasizing one script and limiting the expression of another. Think of women in STEM in general have to de-emphasize their femininity and emphasize their role of developer, because that is what they wish to be seen as and not less than. While not all of these negotiations are fully conscious, some are. Agency in this regard manifests over layers of consciousness and constraining choices. Agency over scripts is thus a source of fluidity. However, the social binary being as it is, it may not be sufficient to find overlap within the available scripts. There may not be overlap that is intelligible or leads to acceptable social consequences for the individual. In that case, the individual may have to create diverging scripts offering a new pathway. This new pathway may require a community to become legible, stemming from populations for which the current framework simply does not work to account for their experience of reality. In turn, 
new identities emerge and become clusters with their own scripts, legible by more than the community they stemmed from. The very concept of discrete category, binary genders, may be challenged by this polysemy, rooted at the heart of the complexity of an individual's specific position. Clusters of associations can arise in social settings due to stable intersections, for instance. The condition for cultural change is that it can be picked up by other agents, thereby gain social communicability. Sub-communities can easily form and gather in urban settings because the density is higher and the probability of similar people finding each other follows. This promotes expansion of the script clusters for individuals exposed to this variety. In a context where this overlap happens for any given individual, associations to gender roles become larger. Now, all these variations have vastly contributed to the expansion of the masculine and feminine clusters of scripts to the point where they are not clearly separate anymore in some areas of subcultures where more personal freedom is afforded. Notice just the fact that I myself am speaking to you. This is a large departure from 60 years ago. In this way, the concepts are not segregated anymore and the associations between the categories have expanded to largely overlap. They may not allow for easy segregation of the gendered patterns and ultimately for predictability. New clusters and categories have developed into new possible identities. Previously unavailable identities that were simply unintelligible in terms of gendered scripts can now be read because they have garnered enough momentum and power to be socially meaningful. Similarly, the porosity of gender concept has allowed agents to see themselves not as segregated and stable anymore, but as fluid and potentially interchangeable. Unfortunately, outside of the communities who can easily read these gender identifications, people adopting them may thus still face resistance, which means their affordance field or complex interactions of their own intersections and the way in which the environment will react and constrain them. Embodying their intersection may also prove troublesome for them in mainstream society since their bodies will be read with difficulty or brought back into the binary fold as non-prototypical expressions and therefore lower on the social hierarchy. So I have some key takeaways for you if you'll stay with me a moment longer. The first takeaway Genders on the inactive ecological view proposed here are enacted by individuals as they come to perceive and respond normatively, that is, perform the action afforded, to the gendered landscape of affordances built and maintained by their culture. If you want to read more about this, you can read Foucault and the concept of dispositif. In a binary gendered culture, clothing, restroom, seats, school, college classes, offices, labs, streets, buses, emotional expression, knowledge, afford different things to men and women. <laughs> I'll explain the French word later if you want. In such a culture, individual, um, individual become men or women as they come to pre-reflectively perceive the fields of affordances associated with one of the two genders and automatically normatively respond to them setting off chains of affordance loops through which a gender is enacted. As perception and automatic responding are both pre-reflexive, enacting a gender isn't a matter necessarily of conscious choice, though individuals can apply voluntary consciousness to resist, modulate, or otherwise modify an automatic response, opening a path towards non or less normative gender for that culture. The second takeaway, and please don't take this as a violence towards the concept of men so much as the idea that um, men in themselves, the, the men, the he-men, may not exist. Thus, gender is embodied since the affordances individuals can perceive depend on their action capacities, which partly depend on their body. Biological sex is one part of an individual's anatomy and physiology, and as such affects its action capacities enabling and sometimes facilitating others. But on our view, biological sex links to gender is mediated by action capacities, which are dependent on the body as a whole, and not just on its sexual characteristics. Biological sex may also be partly responsible for the affordances others perceive an individual, 
especially in cultures that choose to amplify some of these differences, uh, for instance, uh, secondary sexual characteristics. Or sometimes it's not, it has nothing to do with biological sex, like hair length. Since no two bodies and action capacities are alike, there is no universal men and no universal women. And since bodies and action capacities change throughout the lifetime, the lifetime their gender at this fine grain also changes. Every single body is distinct, similarities abound, and they create zones of density and zones of relative sparsity. Then you can sort of see how it creates a gradient. Now, gender, in our view, is also situated in a field of affordances individuals can perceive on the affordance their culture provides. It can be enacted when individuals perceive the presence of gendered cultural fields, and their inaction is at a given moment situated where the fields are present. Without gender fields, there is no gender. But it also supports intersectionality since the cultural fields are built and maintained by cultures institutions, orientation, class uh, abilities, neurotypicality, race, age. The fields of affordances culturally offered to individuals are dependent on all these factors. There isn't such thing as men or women because the affordances can uh, that an individual can perceive in a situation are intersectional. So we saw that gender is uh, normative. It is normative in the first instance. So the disruption of the smooth flow of action may be met with amusement when an, when an agent chooses not to be normative or cannot be normative. For a variety of reasons, individuals and also governments and other institutions may attempt to limit or ban some of these disruptions. Gender scripts or the failure of an expectation, um, if they produce the failure of an expected asso expectation associated with a gender cultural affordance field, may disrupt this flow. And it may be met from anything, from amusement to violence to legislation. And finally, they, a lot of people have vested a large resources into policing gender norms. Um, it's a situation that may call for political actions when genders or groups unjustly affected by the policing and violence must redress the wrongs. This brings us to the last aspect of gender, our account on reliance. That is the fact that gender is bound with justice issues. Gendered cultural affordance landscape is built and maintained by a culture's institution. It opens the question of distributive justice. Are affordances distributed equitably in a given gendered society, or do they favor one gender over another? If they are not, what actions are available to ensure an equitable distribution of the field of affordances? And that's the question I leave you with today. So I wish to thank Ines Polito, who really helped us with this paper, and Maxwell Ramstead, with whom we've had lengthy conversations um, to bring about these thoughts. Thank you, Mal. Oh. Um, all right, well, we have uh, time for maybe one question. Does someone want to come and ask a question? Or maybe you can take time to form a little cue in front of me. I mean, we, we have we have time for at least one question. Sergio, I saw you move around. Is that, is that a question? If no one has a question, I have a, I have a question. What is the, the, uh, the appealing to, um, I mean, I, I really love the presentation. Uh, I, I'm in broad agreement with you, but specifically, what do you think appealing to the ecological and inactive uh, framework over and above just vanilla active inference brings to the table. Uh, it, yeah. I think it's a translational account. A lot of fields use uh, the inactive framework. They understand it. There are some um, categories which can be brought to bear in other fields. And I think they naturally uh, work with uh, some some parts of active inference. So without necessarily understanding how to unfold the formalism, you can still move through these ideas and then you can um, unfold the formalism. But I would discourage people who do not understand the formalism from necessarily directly engaging with active inference or, or they will get lost in the weeds. Whereas in general, inactivism does not 
require this uh, this this formalism in order to have the right concepts in place. That's the end of my answer, Maxwell. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. I'll leave the uh, the floor to Stephen. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, I suppose one question, because um, I can see how this can be useful as well to have conversations with people about, you know, real world questions. And I was wondering how you might meet that challenge if someone came back the other way and started saying, there's people um, putting scripts out into the world that were influencing people, you know what I mean? As well as having the opportunity, because um, I think also there's a lot of opportunities in cities for people to have, you know, maybe they go to certain clubs, they can have just a social experience, which then cultivates the chance for them to play. But then there's also this scripts. Um, I wonder how you sort of balance that or think about that. So if I understand the question properly, you're asking about potentially negative destructive scripts. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and, and, and also maybe actors out there in the world who want to cast um, want to cast a negative uh, light on the the ability for people to have more gender fluidity, right? And so they might they might use that from another direction and say that the scripts have been manipulative, right? So how to to try and you know, how would you answer that or try to negate that or talk about that? Well, I mean, the argument I'm making can lead directly to that conclusion without too much work, right? So it's this idea that if you are different, you cause prediction error to other people. Um, and I mean, we can go back to Mark's point about error digestion, right? It's, should we be in a world which never promotes any error at all? That creates potentially an epistemically weak field. Um, and it also can lead us to a brittle world where we may all be super coordinated, but we may be coordinated into a ditch or be unable to eventually get out of a potential um, local minimum. So that's, I guess, my answer. Uh, another, another point is um, the reason this script came about is because, I mean, one of the reasons this script might have come about, I don't want to be too uh, prescriptive here, is that the people were already not quite finding themselves in the scripts that were proposed to them. They couldn't find exactly um, what their reality necessitated in order to make sense to them and to people they chose to interact with properly because they kept giving these errors by trying to perform something which wasn't really them. This is something that we find a lot in experiences of, um, of a trans identity where they really do try for a while. Like, like a lot of people try to perform and in fact overperform masculinity. I and mean, it just, it feels, it feels wrong. It doesn't explain their reality. And sometimes they kind of just perform it a little wrong. Like they, this is, it, it, they have to like kind of learn it extra hard. So it's, um, it's something we also find in, in autism, right? The, this idea of masking where you have to perform some social expectation about yourself, which is taking a lot of work and you might not be doing quite right. So anyway, I think uh, I think it's ending this turn, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to get off the stage. <laughs>